So I'm going to start with an acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Natasinin and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So uh, thanks for um, joining us online. Uh, so uh, the first thing I want to do is um, acknowledge uh, one of our members has received an observing certificate, and that's Emma Duke. She's, um, I'd like to congratulate her. She's um, completed the Explore the Universe. And Emma, I guess that the certificate has actually gone to you. You're, you're online there, right? Uh, yeah, it came a while ago. Thank you. Okay, well, congratulations, and uh, we can all clap for Emma. And... Uh, <laughs> So good work. Did you have fun doing that? Yeah, I enjoyed it. Good. Well, there's there's more certificates, so we're looking forward to your uh, progress. Thank you. And we'll, you know, any help that uh, we can give you, we'll be happy to do. And um, so there are two announcements. One is happier than the other. Um, next month, the meeting is going to be um, hopefully on campus and it'll be Jim Johnson talking about filters for astrophotography. Tonight we're having Gary talking about visual filters for visual. But the other thing which some of you may have seen um, just tonight is that Sky News is going to be winding up. And um, this has got to do with the finances. It's been losing money. It has been a severe issue for the RESC and so they just announced this today and you'll be probably hearing some more about that um, but I figured since it had already since it had been posted today and um, did you see it on did you see an email about it yeah yeah so there 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 have been has been an email about it so um, we just wanted to bring it to your attention. So it's also on Facebook. There was a okay. It's apparently also on Facebook now. Um, and <laughs> we we've had the last <laughs> couple of meetings. We've had sort of historical um, people have found artifacts that they've posted on the um, RESCNL talk site, and um, so I don't know. Maybe this is going to become a a monthly event, but uh, here's a certificate that John Peddle got um, many, many years ago, 26 years ago, just just about, um, that he had seen Comet Hale Bop. And uh, so congratulations to John, but it's sort of fun, you know, if people find these things and pull them out, it's sort of fun to see the you can see that the lo logo has changed, but the mailing address has not. And uh, and also, Randy and Sue mentioned something about Lucy, and um, I just wanted to uh, mention this sort of a little addendum. Um, I oh, there it goes. The green, so Lucy. The Lucy probe, which I talked about last month, is the magenta. And you see right there, this green um, object is the uh, an asteroid in the main asteroid belt. And since Lucy was launched, I guess they figured out that it's on its first time out when it just does, just sort of skims right there through the main asteroid belt it's actually going to be close enough to this asteroid unfortunately it's not Gary Diamond asteroid um, that with a very small course adjustment it can get to within um, 450 uh, kilometers 
And so, and that'll happen in November. And so they're going to do that. And in addition to being able to have a look at a, another asteroid, it will give them an early test of their asteroid tracking system. So that's sort of fun. And I just thought I'd pass that along. And, and thanks to Stu and Randy for drawing that to my attention. Um, I don't know if we've got any visitors, but um, we have lots of benefits, including the telescopes that you can rent, um, apparently not Sky News anymore, but one of the big benefits is the chat group, and if you haven't already asked Randy to get onto that, I'd encourage you to do that. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of shared observations and discussion and a lot of mentoring people who are trying to learn how to do things. There's lots of people ready to share their expertise and there are weekly bulletins. Um, and so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and invite Gary to talk about filters for visual observing. And he's gonna, um, this is something most people with a telescope have a set of filters. I do, but I almost never use them and I probably should. So Gary's gonna tell us why. So I'm gonna stop sharing and invite Gary to go ahead and share. Okay, let's see. Okay, okay. so far so good? Yeah, but, uh, okay, it didn't... Uh, you need the... to click the little... Oh, there we go. There you are. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna mute and... Okay, uh, thanks Mike. Uh, for allowing me to talk about uh, visual observing. I've been an observer for over 50 years now. Uh, I like observing the planets and uh, deep sky. And I've done some astrophotography. I find now that I just don't have the patience for astrophotography. Uh, I can't do 20 hours in front of a computer trying to get that beautiful picture. And basically I like uh, uh, visual observing. I still do some. Uh, uh, astrophotography, but uh, Mike asked me to talk about uh, the visual filters. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, most people, when they first get into astronomy, they get their two eyepieces and then they say, oh, I want more details. So they go out and they buy and they set uh, parafocal eyepieces, which means that they can take one eyepiece, focus, and then take that one out, put the other one in, it'll be in focus. And they usually buy them in kits like you see here. And the kit usually comes with filters. Now there are something like 21 different types of color filters for planetary observing. And I'm only gonna talk about the ones that I've used. So it won't be a long talk, hopefully, type of thing. But anyway, that's it. And I find that with most people, there's a difference between looking and observing. Oh, I've looked at the planets, you know. Oh, okay, I can see a thing. Observing. You take the time and you start to see things that when you first look, oh yeah, I can see two lines on, two bands on Jupiter. But observing, you start to see four bands on Jupiter. You see fatoons, you see little bays going in and stuff like that. So filters, especially color filters, they don't enhance, they, well, yeah, they enhance the image. You, they don't show you more than what can be seen there. And some people can say, well, my eyes are good enough and I don't need filters. And that's true. Some people uh, have good vision, but other people, the actual filter does improve the image. And I found over the years, especially when observing Mars, stuff like that, that adding these filters lets you not only identify uh, a cloud better, but identify, is it a blue cloud or a clear cloud? Like uh, I was observing there a couple, about a month ago now, I guess, and Mike was observing at the same night and we both saw clouds and I was able to tell him that, hey, this cloud with one filter tells me that the cloud packs out and it could be a blue, uh, a blue cloud. But when I added the other filter, the yellow filter, it told me, no, it wasn't one. So that's the idea of, of, of the things. And there's, so the filter just cuts down on the light improving the contrast. It's only a slight enhancement. You're not gonna go, wow. Matter of fact, the only filter in this system I'm gonna talk about tonight 
will be a bit later. That's a wow factor filter. These ones just help you increase the contrast so that you can see the, the detail a little bit better. Okay. Uh, they're set up in a system called the uh, Rotman system, which was uh, developed by for Kodak in 1904, I think, or 1901. I can't remember right now. And basically, you'll see it. There's a number, and that tells you the color. And you'll either see uh, A, B, C, D, and that will tell you how deep a density it is. You can also buy the plastic filters. I used the plastic filters at once, and I, I would uh, put them in a the slide like you see over here. I don't know if my arrow shows up. But this is a slide, and I have a worth 25 red and a 58 green and a 47 blue. They're plastic. You can combine them in a filter so you can put them over your eye piece and look true, and it works quite fast. But they seem to get beat up pretty fast in my time, especially when you're out in the dark and you drop them in your fingers and your glass. So glass ones last longer. They're better coated. And uh, they are eight bucks. I think they're 16 now each. So you can figure out which ones you want. But, you know, the glass ones last longer. And I would go with the glass. But you can get both. So I'm going to talk about filters. And the first filter I'm going to talk about is not the planetary filters at all. It's the moon filter. Because when you buy your telescope, you usually get a moon filter. Or you may even get a solar filter like this. If you get a solar filter like this, just throw it in the trash. All that will do is the heat will come in just like when you're when you were a kid and you had a magnifying glass and you magnified the bug and burnt it. That's how long these filters last. The sun filter will last. It'll crack and you'll go blind. Okay. So if you get one of these filters and they're still out there and then they say sun, that's okay. But this is a moon filter. Okay. If you plan to spend a lot of time viewing the moon, and I'm not talking about just at full moon. People think, oh, we use this filter at full moon. But no, you use it at all the different stages, phases of the moon. Okay. There are the things, some of them, uh, the moon filters are green. They give a green cast. And the Celestron filter is the worst for that. I, I truly don't like the Celestron filter. It gives such a green cast. Uh, a better way of looking at them is with the neutral densities. Now, with a neutral density, depending on your telescope, for six inches and less, you need one that, uh, that says 25%. That means about 50% of the light is brought back. So you don't get that little burnt out eye when you look at the moon. You know, when you look at the moon and you take it back, you see that black spot for your moon thing. This helps get rid of that, but it also brings out the detail in the riffles and, the, and right on the edge between the dark, the terminator between the dark and the thing. And, uh, and you're looking at the crater, you can actually see wonderful things. If you got a 18, eight inch or greater, go with the 13% uh, uh, neutral density. Neutral density doesn't give you that green color. It cuts down the thing. And they're actually not, not only good for the planets, but they're good for uh, Venus, Jupiter, any of the ones that are too bright. You'll be surprised how much detail they bring out. Another type of polarizing filter, uh, another type of moon filter is the polarizing filter, which is two filters. And you can turn them and you can go from zero to about 50% darkness. And these are really good because certain parts of the moon are brighter than the others and you can adjust it. Now, because the filter usually goes on the end of the uh, eyepiece, uh, I usually take them apart because I put one on the end of my finder and one on the end of my eyepiece. So when I'm looking through my eyepiece, I can turn and get that 25, 30, 50 percent darkness while not having not to take out the eyepiece all the time and twirling it around. So that's a little trick of the trade and it works very good. So this is for the moon. And here I have a good demonstration. This is uh, on your right is the moon shot. And you can uh, see how bright it is. And you can see some of the sh things here, but they're hard to see and stuff like this. While with the moon densides or the polarizing moon or even a, a, a color filters like green, which would put a green cast on this, but these are the moon filter right there. You can see how the 
ripples are brought out much better here, right over here on your on your left hand side. You can actually see how much the planet or the moon is improved in the contrast. You don't have this washed out area here. You can see the shadow in here. You can see the detail here. Uh, you can see the ridges. You can follow the valley. You can follow the little craters here, which are almost lost in this area here. You can see the flow over on the on the right. You can see the, the flow of the magna from the dark to the light. So a moon filter is a fantastic way to start, and it's really good. And there are the three types of moon filters. The uh, moon filter itself, which gives a green color, false green color. The neutral density, uh, if you're using a, a smaller telescope to uh, six or less, use the 25. And if you're using eight or better, use the 13. It cuts down on the amount of, of light coming in. Now let's go to the colored uh, planetary filters. Uh, they improve the viewing of the planet. The effect is minor and usually disappoints beginners. Beginners take the filters, look at them, and they say, I can't see any difference. Why the heck? But there is a slight difference. And like I said, you got to be an observer rather than a looker. You got to take the time to see. And like I said, the filter blacks out certain colors. So it changes the contrast, as you saw in the other picture. So you have a darkness and a lightness. And that darkness and contrast is what these filters improve. Now, before I get started and forget, if you've got a telescope of five inches or less, you only need three of these color filters to start with. Because the other ones are more to have, uh, you need more gathering light to get through the transparency. So like a 25 red wouldn't work on a two inch telescope. You're wasting your time. Uh, so I'd recommend a, a yellow number eight, a 21 orange, and an 80 blue. There are the three that I'd recommend if you have a telescope less than five inches. They're the ones you'll use all the time, and they'll be the most effective for that size telescope. Okay, now let's get in. Orange, number 25, increases the contrast between the red and the yellows or the orange on the Mars. When you look at Mars the first time, it looks all pink. And then after observing a little while, you'll see that there's this change in the colors. The seas are different and stuff like that. And by using the orange, it really brings out the boundaries between these areas. So you can see the reds and the yellows. Okay. Type of thing. On Jupiter, it sharpens up the belts and really brings out the red spot. The red spot just pops out, I always find, in the orange 21. On Saturn, it increases the surface detail. On Saturn, you look at Saturn, most times you don't see much detail. But the orange, and the problem with most people find with these filters is that it turns it all orange. <laughs> or if it turns it all red or it turns it all blue. But what it shows up, it increases that contrast like I was talking, that night and day, that slight contrast, so they can actually see the belt and brings out the spots. Uh, and it is one of the good ones for using on Mercury and Venus when you're observing during the daytime. It really brings that information out. And also on, on Saturn, uh, if you're doing it in the daytime and you're doing a, uh, a school or, or a, you know, an open house and it's daytime and you, you know where Saturn is in the daytime and you put this orange filter on, it gives you enough contrast that you can see Saturn. Now, You'll get lots of complaints like, how come the, uh, the sky isn't blue? And you have to tell them why, because you got the filter. But it really does bring it out. So if you want, if you're into showing planets during the daytime, which I happen to do sometimes when I'm with schools, uh, the orange filter brings it out. And it also good. And also, seeing that there's a comet in the sky, supposedly, I've been trying to get a, a good spectrum of it lately. Uh, this is a good one to use on comets for the dust tail and the coma. It brings out the coma. You can actually see it increase and you can see more of the tail, the dust tail. So this one is a great one for the dust tail. Okay. The 25 red. Use it on an eight or better telescope. If it's less than uh, 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 an eight inch telescope, 
uh, it's just too dense. That's why the tw orange 21 one will work better. But if you're, you know, got an eight inch or 12 inch or 16 inch, this is really good. On Jupiter, it definitely uh, gives a contrast between the cloud formations and you can actually see the higher clouds and lower cloud density type of thing. Later tone surfaces, details on it. The curves in the foons. On Mars, it's, oh, it defines the polar cap and the seas, marinas, what we used to call seas. On Mars, there's that beautiful thing. It just pops out at me, especially the polar cap. And it's really good because it shows you the polar cap up as opposed to the uh, polar hood, which usually covers the polar cap. And the polar cap goes back. On Venus, it reduces the glare. And you can start to see things on the cloudy Venus atmosphere. You can see the little dust marking type of thing. Uh, now, like I say, uh, use it to think. And it also <laughs> improves bad seeing. And in Newfoundland, we have bad seeing. But if you go out and the seeing is bad, now, I mean, it ain't going to, you know, make it fantastic. But if you got really bad seeing and you put this filter in, the seeing gets a little bit better. It's it's quite pretty good for that. So, and here I just want to show you what a red filter does. On the right is the original picture. You can uh, see the polar cap on the bottom there. You can see, uh, I think that's a cidium right here, the black mark just above the polar cap. You can see a cloud in the thing and another edge cloud. While with the red filter, notice how it just shows up really well. The polar cap pops right out at you. And actually, it gets rid of the little hood. Huh? You can see the clouds, and you can see the dark markings quite well, much better. So it really does do a little improvement on your things. Ah, the yellow filters. Yellow number 12, 75, 74% transmission. On Jupiter and Saturn, it enhances the orange and red features. Now, over the years, uh, the colors seem to fade. So sometimes you see them red bands, and sometimes you see them as orange bands. Uh, you'll actually see the big dip, uh, the giant red spot like that. So this enhances the red and orange things. It really lights them up, gives them that contrast between them. On Mars, it lightens up the red and orange features, like I said before, and it enhances the blue clouds. So if you're looking through a green filter, and you see a cloud, and you say, I wonder if that's a blue cloud. You put in the yellow filter, boom, it'll tell you that, hey, this is a blue cloud because it looks blue in the yellow filter. Uh, it's uh, most used for the Martian atmosphere. So this one is used for finding things like the polar cap, the hood, and stuff like that. Really good. On the moon, it's at the cruises. Uh, Thing. Matter of fact, pooling a neutral density and the number 12 on the moon will give you uh, a good contrast in your lunar features. It's also good for bringing out Uranus and Neptune's surface. Now, I, I have written there stands out, but like I say, it just enhances it. Especially I find in the, in the 12 and I've seen it in 17. It's also a great one for looking at the dust tail in comets. So they're not just for planets, as, as I was saying, typically. The number 15 is uh, another yellow one. On Mars, it brings out the surface features and the polar cap, so you see it much better. On Jupiter, it enhances the red and orange features and bands and the festoons. Now, this is something. Like, uh, I like this filter because usually when you look at the bands and the, and the uh, you know, the... Yeah, the cloud belts, the bands. What happens is this one helps the contrast enough that you can see the indent of a bay or a round platoon, which looks like a uh, like a red spot, but it's white. And they, they go as they cross type of thing. It, it pops out. And on, this is the one to use. If you're having trouble seeing the Cassini division on Saturn, this is the one. It really pops out the contrast in the rings that the Cassini division, that black line that you say, I think it's there. With that one, you'll actually see it there. It just boom, pops up right out. <laughs> it makes me feel really good. 
Uh, I also find it good on Venus. I do a lot of Venus stuff. It picks up the low contrast cloud detail. Uh, it, some people, you, uh, if you have ever talked about Venus and stuff like that, you sometimes see a Y uh, cloud formation. This is, is good. It also good for improving lunar uh, surfaces, and it's good for spotting, observing Venus and Mercury detail during the daytime. Okay, because of, there's no contrast, and you'll find Mercury and Venus are just so bright uh, as they get into the darkness, and with Mercury it goes down so fast. It's amazing the number of, of uh, professional, not alone amateur astronomers that haven't seen Mercury go to its phases. And, 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 and you do see some nice stuff. Also, I like this one for the sun. I find in white light, I find putting this filter on, you get that yellow color, which everybody thinks the sun looks like, and we all know it's not, but it gives you that yellow color. And it also helps bring out the sunspots. You can actually see the contrast, especially the little ones and stuff like that. And you can see, you know, the uh, the dying part of the uh, sunspot. I can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, take a thing. So number 15 is clean. Okay. So I want to show you the difference in the uh, in the yellow thing. On the right is the is a original means without a filter. And this is with the yellow filter. And I don't know if my arrow shows you up, but you'll notice... You can see how the band on the moon shows up real good, type of thing, and the division type of thing. So this is just some of the stuff you can see. Uh, these are done actually for visual, uh, rather than the photograph, because when you photograph using these yellow filters, it shows up much better. But I wanted to give you the idea of, hey, this is what it looks like. With your telescope, so you can see it's it's not that much difference, but there is that slight detail that you're getting in in the in in the band, and you can see the division much better. Okay, if you're only going to buy one filter in the color market, the blue eighty A is the number one to get. It's the all round uh, filter. Okay, on Jupiter it enhances the uh, uh, ribs and the futons and the riddles and the red spot pops out. On Saturn, it brings out the detail in the belts, uh, the popular, uh, the polar feature, and storms. Storms are very rare on Jupe on Saturn, but when they're there, that's the filter. They'll pop them out to you. It's also great for if, if you're observing the moon. So if you only want one filter, this is the way to go. Also, if you're into double stars, which I have a bright one right next to it, next one. Uh, the ADA dims it enough that you can see uh, the two stars really good. Especially uh, Antares is a good example of it. Also, it's good on the bright deep sky objects. Like M27, you see a little bit more detail than just the dumb bars. And on M51, you actually start to see some of the, in a dark spot, by the way, not in the city of St. John's anymore. In a, in a dark spot, you can actually see the uh, arms going out. Not just the big arm, you'll see little ones. So it's good for that. And it's on comets. Instead of where the other one, the yellow one I think I was talking about, talked about uh, an orange 21, talked about the dust tail. But uh, the blue, ADA blue, is the ion tail that's, that pops out on this one. And the iron tail is the one that has the most structure, by the way. And it has, uh, I guess, because it's, uh, it usually shows up blue with our eyes anyway, it really enhances this. So if you're into the, looking at the tails and stuff like that, this is it. So of all the color filters, I find the blue to be the most useful overall. Okay. And these are the ones that I've used. And here you can see the difference in the blue here on Saturn. There's the original on the left, and on the right, we've enhanced. You can uh, see the uh, 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 band really comes out a bit quite better. Uh, the cap comes out, and the gap is seen. Not as good as in the other one, but still there. So you can see that 
the filters don't go wow at you, but they do bring out some enhancement. And if you take the time, you look at it, and you get to appreciate seeing some of the stuff that most of us look at. Oh, there's Saturn. Let's go on to something else. Or that sort of thing. Okay. The green 56. Observations of the Martian polar ice cap. The green 56 is it. If you want to see the Michael mountains on the ice cap, which uh, at the beginning of the year, the cap is all white, and the hood goes, but the cap is all together. And then it starts to melt and it goes back. And as it goes back, it melts and opens up and you actually see the gap and Michael's uh, mountains, I think they're called. And with the green filter, that's the one to go. Uh, uh, yellow tinted dust storms on planet's surface on Mars increases the red uh, and blue regions in the Jupiter's atmosphere and cloud belts. And it's good for the lunar observing too. Okay. Uh, the green 58 on Jupiter increases uh, contrast in the lighter parts of the surface. Uh, so when you're looking at Jupiter, sometimes you just see this band going by. But by putting in the, in the filter, you can actually see the details. Like this is the fan like this when you're going out the filter. But then you can see the gaps and, and, and the waves. You can see that, oh, some of this stuff is moving at 360 while this one's moving at 300 or something like that. You can actually start to see some info detail. Uh, on Mars, if you want to see Lowell's band, now Lowell's band is, uh, what happens is you have the polar cap. And as the polar cap melts from being down in latitude 60, it goes up to about latitude 80. As it melts, the water in the uh, soil makes this band. And it was first discovered by Lowell. So that's why it's called the Lowell band. And this filter 58 just pops it out at you. It booms, right? Like when you're looking with your naked eye at it and you're saying, yeah, I, I think it's there. Put that filter in. And you'll see the contrast. It's this band, right? And it's really deep here, and this white hair, and it's thing. And you got this band going around. It's kind of cool to see how uh, the belt goes back. It's also good on Venus. The contrast for the atmospheric features, like the Y and the X, are excellent on this. But it only works on an eight inch or better, right? So, uh, you know, like I said, some of these filters are only good for the bigger scopes. So I think that's it here. Uh, I'm showing you Saturn again, right? The original. And you can see the ring really coming out here now. You can see it actually all the way over to here and here. I don't know. Uh, does anybody see my pointer? Yes. Okay. You see the band, how, you know, it's an indication here and an indication here. Well, over here to the division, you can actually see it coming in about here and around back here. And you can see this, this band right here is showing up really good. That's, you know, like I, I, like I said, these filters and wow. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> we were talking about the telescope, so I took it out to show you. I, uh, I uh, bought a, a slide slap filter years ago before they had the round ones and the power driven. But that puts all my, uh, I can hold eight filters in and it just moves back and forth. I don't know if you can see it here. Type of thing. Anyway, you put your eyepiece in, as you can see over here, and you just slip the things back and forth. So if I'm looking at, the, at Mars and I'm, I'm saying, oh, is this a blue cloud or is this a, a W cloud? Oh, I need my green with my yellow over here, right? I don't have them lined up here very good type of thing. I'll just swip into back and forth so I can see and add my information that I can send off. Hey, uh, there was a blue cloud as opposed to the white cloud or or there's an or or orthographic cloud and which usually are around W's and usually found around uh, uh, the volcanoes. And it's just interesting. I was watching the, uh, uh, what do you call that thing? The internet. <laughs> Excuse me. And 
uh, NASA's talking about, oh, this, there's, there's this white cloud. And the first time they've seen it, uh, they thought it was a volcano erupting. But it happens all the time. It's been uh, seen years and years. And uh, it starts and it lasts for about, uh, about a month, I think. And it spans out. And basically, is uh, the sun angle melts the ice on that side and creates the cloud that it looks like a volcano erupting and the smoke is going this way. It's kind of cool. And it looks pretty good in, in the things. I, I, I got to see it in the 12 inch scope with a, uh, the uh, yellow, I think, and built it myself. So over the years. Anyway, gone to totally off topic again, like I usually do. Sorry about that. Let's go with the narrow band filters. Now, if you want to see a wow factor, get an oxygen-free filter. Get a load of the one that the center has, okay? You go out, put it in your scope, and look at the veil nebula. Now, look at it without the veil nebula, and you're saying, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think I see it. The oxygen-3, you go, wow, it looks just like a black and white picture of the uh, veil nebula. You can see it, and you can... Follow the veil nebula that it curls up like like when my dad used to smoke his pipe and the smoke would twirl up and twirl around. And that's exactly what you can see with this filter. <laughs> it, it, it is one of the best filters for visual and uh, astronomy. Don't get me wrong, but we're talking visual here. And I got this one because I wanted to see that. And uh, I remember... Uh, 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 being on the uh, RAS list and uh, back, oh, geez, uh, Father Kimball, Father Kimball, the Kimball thing, he was saying, you know, take it and put it up to your eye, go out to a dark site. And we did, and we compared, and I was able to see the North American nebula with my eye using the oxygen 3 filter. It just popped out. It looks just like the North, like usually when you're looking through a telescope, the North American nebula. Uh, the, the narrow field ones, you don't get to see. You have to go down. There's, you know, Florida and the Mexican coast. But to see the whole line out, it's kind of cute just with your naked eye. It's, it was one of my, you know, wow factors. So if you're going to buy a narrow band filter, the oxygen 3 is the one to get. It makes planetary, like M, M, M57, uh, uh, looks like a dumbbell, right? But with that action filter, it actually looks like the whole, you can see the whole circle, the apple, and, and so much more detail. And if you get into planetary nebulas, like uh, M57 and uh, M27, they're nice and big. But when you start to get into planetary nebulas, they're very small. And when you're using your naked eye and you're looking through the telescope to find that, planet, and you can't find it because it looks just like another star, you put this oxygen 3 filter in, and boom, it looks like. Uh, Neptune. You know, when you look at Neptune through your telescope, that nice round disk, that's exactly what it looks like. Your planet, so your planetary nebulas just pop out like that. Oh, I really loved it when I was into that. And it's good for uh, double stars too, especially really bright ones like Antares. Uh, matter of fact, the primary star is red and the secondary is green. Oh, look, I even put that in. And as you can see, I even said on the bottom of my notes, my favorite specialty filter. Oh, okay. Next one is the HB beta filter. It's good for the horse head. And uh, I wasn't impressed with it. Uh, yeah, it brought it out. But, you know, I was expecting like, uh, like seeing the horse's head. But basically, all you saw was a cloud with an indent. And my best view of, of the horse head, naked eye, was in a six-inch... Uh, Newtonian telescope. Uh, so you don't need a big telescope to see that with the naked eye. And you could actually see the indent. It's the contrast that you need. Uh, for the money, I wouldn't waste my money on buying that if you want to see the horse head nebula. Just photograph. It's so easy to photograph. Now it's it's an unbelievable type of thing. Okay. But I, I've used it type of thing. Uh, light pollution filter. I brought a light pollution filter. The only one I brought was uh, Celestron. Uh, I've not big a big fan of it, 
it's only really good for nebula. It's not good for uh, galaxies and most light pollution filters and type of thing. But uh, I thought to show you, this is uh, M57 with out and on your right with. So it does bring in that detail. And as you can see, the, like I said, the, the oxygen three filter shows it like that, shows this thing. Usually you just see this part right over here, right? So you get to see this. But uh, my, uh, I, I really don't use it unless I'm doing some astrophotography in the city. But uh, visually, I'm I was disappointed. Mm -hmm. So let's go with my conclusions. I don't know how long I've been at this. I got verbal diarrhea, so you know what I'm like. Okay. So if you want to see things in the night sky in a clearer, crisper way, a good idea is to purchase some telescope filters. Uh, they're easily installed and removed, and you can get a ton of improved views. In general, atmospheric seeing is improved using the filters, especially the red, then the orange, and the yellow. Those three help to, with the atmospheric seeing, so it's bad, it improves a little bit because it, uh, our atmosphere has a lot of, I guess, the red sign of it, and also some of the planets too. So I've been told. Okay. You need a fair amount of aperture for them to be useful in effect. Like I said, eight inch or better for most of them. If you're don't if you're using a six inch or less, I would go with the number eight yellow, 21 orange, and the 80 blue. They work the best, and you actually see something in them with a two inch telescope to a six inch telescope. Uh, the other ones, you need an eight inch to see any real improvement. Okay. Uh, I'd recommend the hydrogen alpha for someone that said, or the oxygen three. And I, I'll go with the oxygen three. The oxygen three was my wow filter for viewing. I, I use it all the time and it still gives me a wow. It's the wow factor. And I didn't talk about solar filters. Because that can be a whole talk unto itself. I just want to say, if you brought a telescope and you had this little inexpensive solar filter, and it says solar filter, and it looks dark, and it goes into your eyepiece, throw it in the garbage. Your eyes are more important. Do not use. Okay, that's my talk. Hope I uh, threw some stuff at you. This is a, a good site if you want to learn more about uh, uh, things and that's it any thank, questions so thank you very much gary that was a uh, great talk before we get to the questions i just want to remind people that i think we're okay but there may be a conflict with another group using the zoom randy has sent out a another zoom link if we disappear go to rent look for randy's email which went out about an hour ago and we'll reconvene at that zoom link but i don't think we need to because i heard from the other group and they know that we're here um so we can uh that was a great talk gary there was a lot of information and there's a lot of stuff i think that people might want to refer to later on so um maybe we could see if we could actually post your slides on the website somehow. Maybe um, you could talk to Craig because I'm thinking that I would like to go back through the slides and try uh, some of the things you said. I don't know if you can see this. This is a good uh, uh, sheet I have. Uh, it has all the planets up on top, uh, the filters, and what planets they can use for, what comets, what double stars. And so where where that, that come from? That comes from now. It has no copyright on it, so it's got to be copyrighted somewhere. Not recommended. Hmm. I don't know. I've had it for so long. <laughs> I uh, when I first got my filters, uh, there was no you know what to use, what what not to use, and I finally found something, so I I, I kept with it. Uh, there's some uh, really nice articles out on the internet on them. Uh, I find that uh, most of the people that sell them, 
give you a, a general, the, <laughs> the sheet of paper they give you is the same general, if they give you a sheet of paper, it's the same general things and, and not specific, like, like, uh, uh, like there's, like I said, there's 21 and I don't have to use 21. I only use, suggested the ones that I've used and what I thought were good and bad. Uh, but like I said, if your telescope is smaller than eight inches, there's only three that are good. Now, I didn't get into some specialties. Uh, Mar uh, uh, Celestron has a Mars filter, uh, which is uh, I've used once. I actually, I, Randy owns it. <laughs> And we're out at uh, Terra Nova, and I used it on uh, Nick, Nikolai's eight-inch telescope, which is a Newtonian, which is a really sharp image, it's good contrast. And when I put that filter in, it brought out the polar caps and the differences in the uh, seas and the land formations. So uh, I, I have to say, uh, as a as a specialty filter for Mars, uh, I I I. Totally liked it, but I figured I had, you know, I could combine my three filters together. Like I never mentioned that you, you can take your reds and your yellows and you can combine them together and look and give you the whole thing together. And uh, I thought that was just as good. Why spend more money when I already spent money on filters I got that I use less and less these days? Just with hand type of thing. Okay, so Gary, there there are a few questions. Um, one was, could you? Put your slides back to the link at the end. Um, just click on that one because someone wanted to be able to see that. Yeah, that's a. I think that's a, a, a twenty-one minute talk uh, on uh, filters. I thought that was pretty good. Uh, okay. I had I had a I had a few others that I meant to put up, but I guess I didn't put them on the right slide, <laughs> and I don't seem to. Uh, I guess. I guess I, I uh, forgot to put them on this slide and left this slide in. But uh, hey, there's a couple of really good articles I, you'll find on the internet. So there's a couple questions on the chat. Um, Mark Pippi was asking about, um, you were mentioning about viewing the sun um, and using an eight inch Dobsonian and Chris Stevenson answered that. Um, and I think the important thing there is you need to use a a filter like um, Botter film or solar screen or something like that. Yeah, and it's an off-axis filter. So when you put it on the front of your 8-inch, you're actually looking at about uh, a 3-inch a or a 4-inch scope. It turns into a 4-inch scope. That's all because... Uh, an eight inch, even with the, they used to put out the eight inch filters for the eight inch telescopes, the solar telescopes, but they still found that the heat built up in the scope and caused problems with your slash bra. So the off axis one, which makes it a four inch, uh, doesn't bring in all that heat and you get a better image actually. And so, it saves your scope. So that's the, the little hole in your, um, in your cover. Right. Uh, I was yeah. wondering what that was. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, uh, sometimes there's two, uh, uh, two, two of the same size. And if you take them off, uh, if you're doing astrophotography, you take them off. Uh, you can use it as a focuser. What you'll see is two stars, and then when you come to perfect focus, it'll be one star. Oh, okay. Rather than. Uh, uh, the spike one. A lot of people are using the spike one now. I can't remember what the name of that one is. But yeah, that uh, filter cover is kind of cool. Thank but, you. Uh, yeah, don't uh, don't go with the bigger. Isn't always better with the sun. That's why I I left out the sun except for that little tiny filter because uh, I've had so many people when they ask me to come to their house and they show me their scope and say, "Look, I got a solar filter and." And it goes into the eyepiece, and I and I take it and I say throw it out, and I tell them why, because I've seen them crack so often, and yeah, they're very dangerous. Sometimes all I do is I'll I'll point the scope at the sun and take a, a toothpick and put it in front of the eyepiece, and it catches on fire like that, and then they say, oh, <laughs> it it gets the point across very fast. Okay. Matter of fact, I I think I have a uh, 
I don't have one right here. Uh, my plastic cover for your eyepieces when you don't put the diag uh, when you don't have the eyepiece in to keep the dust out. I was setting up the telescope one day to do some solar observing. This was a six inch telescope, and I set it up and I had it pointed, and then I reached down and to put the filter on. I should have put the filter on first, but I forgot. And when I put the filter on, I would smell this plastic burning, and I still had the uh, the, the thing, uh, the dust cap with a hole in it. That time, just to go from picking up the filter and screwing it on, I had burnt a hole in the in the plastic end of the scope. Yeah, when when I got my um, eight inch Dobsonian, which was used, it came with a melted um, eyepiece holder cap. So the same sort of thing had happened to it. Yeah, and, and if you got a fine, fine scope on your scope, make sure you leave the dust cover on the front of it. Uh, we've had a couple of members uh, have their hats burnt and their hair burnt <laughs> while looking down through the filtered, their filtered uh, telescope, but the, the finder scope had the dust covers off and it had burnt their hats and hair. Okay, anyway. so there's a question here from Marcellus. Thanks, Gary. Does anyone have an H2O rejection filter? H2O rejection. I don't know about that. Uh, no. Uh, that's a water filter. Yeah, I know. I was <laughs> that was a joke about clouds. Wow, oh, okay. Well, I, I was wondering I, about that. I okay, thinking, moving said, right along. I was thinking, you know... Uh, uh, to when I was doing research in this, I came across a uh, ad for a filter that sees through clouds. Now, I was trying to find out more information about it. I don't know if it was a, a joke, uh, but uh, uh, it uh, it had an interesting view about uh, it. The filter did cut out clouds. But it was whisper, whisperly clouds. The contrast, the very, you know, sometimes we have them out around our sun all the time. Here it's type of, type of thing. So, uh, in honesty, I know it was a joke, but there seems to might be a filter out there for the very thin, whispery clouds. Okay, Chris. Chris got the joke because he um, he messaged a uh, an emoji that was laughing. So Chris, Chris got it. Yeah, I, um, oh. Jamie Kenny asked best sources for purchasing. Oh, I hate recommending places. Uh, I find Ontario Telescope uh, good. All all star telescope. Uh, that's all. Uh, they're the two that I deal with mostly. Uh, uh, Lumicon have the Best quality, I think. That's just my opinion of, uh, of filters themselves. They're they're really thinking. And th that company has been taken over by I IUA. No, I I can't remember the name of the company. But Lumicon used to make these fantastic filters. Uh, they uh, uh, even the the like I have a Celestron and I had a Lumicon. Which I seem to have lost. That's why I got the Celestra. But the one, uh, the difference is like night and day. Lumicon is, is definitely the better of uh, filters. Lumicon now, is for the Cadillacs. Yeah, I, I I have to say I like Lumicon. Now, uh, you know, I don't know anything about uh, the uh, photography side of of. of uh, uh, only, only of what I've read. This is what I know. Okay. Hey, any question? Any other? Yeah. So I think that's the uh, questions that were uh, on the chat. So any other questions? Yeah. If not, let's thank Gary again. It was a wonderful talk, and uh, we all have lots of things to try out at some point. Yeah. I, I just don't leave them in your in the case or in the corner where you're going at. And the next time the comet is clear, just take it out and see if it does bring out the coma that you can't see or the, 
or the detail in in the dust and the iron trail. <laughs> but uh, I have to say, I like the ADA overall useful one. You get into more and more, like the fifty eight uh, green uh, really brings out the low band stuff like that. And anyway, I'm drifting off. Going okay, off card. So okay. Gary, could you unshare? And there you go. Thank you very much. So I will. Uh, if anybody wants to ask afterwards, or you know, send me an email, I will gladly talk about them. Okay, so um, I'll, I'm going to go through some visual observations. It's past eight thirty, so we seem to have survived. Um. The other group. So the first one I've put up was from someone we just heard from. Um, Gary posted this. It was actually from uh, a little over a month ago, but it's uh, Gary's uh, meteor camera, and it, it, this is pretty cool. So do you want to just say a word about this, Gary? You, you can't have another hour, but you have a couple minutes. Oh, you're muted. It was the only uh, quads that I uh, I got to see or got picked up in the, and I was right at the end, the thirteenth. Their their date, their their peak is the uh, January the third. Uh, but I was just amazed that you can actually see where they're coming from, like they seem to line up. That's it. Yeah. So Gary, is is this a home built camera or is this a commercial one? Uh, this is a home built camera. You can also get them commercial, but it, uh, and it's basically the same thing. But this one was home built because it was uh, like uh, a third of the price rather than $600. I think it was about 200 bucks, 250. Cool. Hmm. Well, okay, Mike, thanks. Could I, could I say something, Mike? What? Go ahead. Oh, Phil's first thing. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I was just wondering what's the size of the field of view here that we're looking at? Uh, this is an eight uh, millimeter because I wanted to get down to seven uh, magnitude. And I'm in the city here. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember the actual thing. This is hooked up, by the way, to the global media network. Yeah. Uh, you know, you must know Dennis. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Vita. Yeah. And uh, geez, it's amazing the, the amount of information people are getting from these. So it's, uh, pretty mm -hmm. good i also posted another one showing someone asked uh uh you know if this is just the meteors and when i showed them the airplanes and the satellites they couldn't believe how much this is a new filter actually that they've installed that cuts down on a lot of the airplanes and butterflies and insects cool uh, could i mention uh, that uh, asteroid meteor from the other night They've uh, they've recovered the first. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. I can't even see myself. Uh, first piece. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, so where yes. where did it land, Randy? Uh, in France. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, oh it yeah. Looks, it looks oh, that's fairly, a big piece. Looks fairly large. That's on the uh, Meteor OBS site or OBS whatever it is. Wow. Did anyone stay up to watch that? By the way. Yeah, I stayed up to watch that. Mm -hmm. There's lots of videos on the uh, Meteor Society site. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Cool. So that's, a, that's the seven ones that they found beforehand. In space beforehand. Matter of fact, the, the, uh, the very first one they found, they also got a spectrum in uh, space uh, was, as it was flying down, and they were able to collect all the information on it. Haven't seen any reports since on uh, how much research was done. But uh, the initial things were saying that, you know, uh, because, because we had one from in space, through to space and that, we could compare the results, you know, what the materials were and see if the spectrums were showing exactly what it was. It was quite interesting. Maybe this one will uh, add more information to it. Cool. Okay, thanks. Let's see the... Uh... Next one, there was a clear night, January 25th, and I took a picture of 
uh, Jupiter and Venus and uh, Sue Hart got a picture of uh, Jupiter and um, Venus must be just off the edge there, but um, the same sort of image, beautiful clear night. And I went out tonight and ran across the street and did a picture of Venus and Jupiter, um, mostly so I could have it for a uh, talk next week. And they're getting closer together, and we'll hear about that uh, a little bit later on. So Jupiter and Venus. Um, and uh, the petals, that was the same night, January 25th, did a picture of the moon. I and mean, this is just a beautiful picture. John, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you want to say a few words about this? That's a pretty amazing picture. You you have a lot of moons in there. You have a close <laughs> yeah, moon and some far away moons. Yeah, like it worked out well. Like it was clouds kind of coming and going. And uh, when, when you get a little bit of cloud in the picture, like it really adds to it, I think. So it worked out well, like uh, the cloud passing by at the time. Along with some Earth shine as well. Yep. Now that's amazing. Thanks. Nice. And say thanks to Andrea. Sure. Yeah, I will. And uh, John Nugent. Um, is John here tonight? Oh, I hope he's not sitting in uh, the room at Mun. Oops, that was a mistake. Anyways, he posted... Um, the Flaming Star Nebula, and he does, uh, you know, he's really sort of mastering the uh, long acquisitions. That's a, a lovely shot. Um, and so I've got a series of observations of the comet, but before I uh, show some of the uh, images, I was wondering if people had observed it uh, visually, if, if there's any sort of reports of when they're able to see it and what they saw, I'm, I'm sure there were some. Anybody want to say something about that? Um, Gary? Uh, no, I, uh, I've been uh, taking, uh, I should say, trying to take uh, a spectrum of it. It'll be my third comet that I've got a spectrum of, but uh, and I was just working on it. I haven't finished it off, but I I, uh, I was comparing them to the other two I have, and uh, this one uh, the uh, uh, the green is really high, while neo wise it was when it was coming in it was high, and then when it came out. It turned yellow, and uh, the uh, the yes uh, sulfurs, I guess I can't remember what they are now. The yes things and comets. I'd have to look it up. I can only think of one report at a time was higher, but it was interesting. Anyway, cool. Yeah, I the the first night that I did a picture of it, which was probably January twenty fifth, but I'm not sure. I also had my Dobsonian out and was able to see it, and that was when it was down close to um, uh, Ursa Minor. And then not our latest storm, but the storm before that, um, it cleared at the end of that storm that night and it was up near Capella and I found it with binoculars. So those were my two visual observations. And uh, any other? Uh, I'll add that I used the uh, orange number 21 to enhance the tail visually through the telescope. Very good. And it does work. <laughs> yep. And it did make the coma bigger. And it looks like John unmuted. Yeah, I saw it um, around the first week of February, around between, between the big and little dipper, almost directly in the middle of them. It was really easy to find. It almost looked like a, a globular cluster. It was kind of like fuzzy. That was in my binoculars. Yeah. Yeah, I had trouble with the binoculars when it was there because for me, it was right over top of a street light. But by the time it was up near Capella, it was 
sort of out of that kind of interference. Yeah. So I had a good, a good view in that direction. Good. So um, here are some of the pictures. Uh, so Jim Johnson, I think, was the first one that posted anything, and, and he posted this one, um, which I guess was when he was starting to acquire images. So that was a, a number of us got pictures on January 25th. And then this is when he combined some uh, two-minute exposures, and you can just sort of make out the iron tail there and the nice green picture. So this, that was the first local image that I sh I saw. And so that evening I did some pictures and um, used DSS. You can either uh, stack just the comet and let the stars trail or stack the stars and the comet separately and it combines them and but gives a few artifacts so that was my first shot but I didn't really get uh, maybe a little bit of the iron tail there and that was 31 30 second shots and and I did do an animated gif which some people um may have seen on the talk so that's the motion over um about 25 minutes. And then Jim Stacy, uh, I think we've got two shots from Jim Stacy, so um, I'll let him say something about the later one, but this one was that same night. Um, and you can see the dust tail very well. And he's done the comet and stars um, stacking in Pix Insight. Oh, and then this is, um, so Jim, are you there? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. So this was a couple nights later when it was nice and uh, you can see you can see the iron tail. So you, you want to say a word or two about this? Um, yeah, well, we, we, um, we had uh, several nights in, in January and, and February uh, for looking at the comment and uh, that's quite uh, quite unusual here. Um, but we had a lot of cloud as well. So uh, dealing with the cloud was a bit uh, difficult. This particular, the, the first one, that the, the first um, view, you, you were able to see a, a little bit of the anti-tail, which is a sort of an uh, optical illusion caused by the way the, the, way the, way the, um, the, the dust is streams behind the comet. And you actually see uh, something that basically is opposite to the direction of the of motion, so, um, and, and then the next one, um, there's nothing that uh, substitutes for more, for more time and more exposure time. So you can see that there's a there's a there's a bit more in the way of uh, definition, and uh, there's a the good the green coma, um, and then there's the uh, sort of a, a a dusty tail coming, uh, drifting away, and then there's a, a faint hint of the uh, of the ion tail in, in this particular version as well. Yep, okay, thanks. And so I did another one the same night and I could also see the ion tail and I just, again, just did the comet stacking. And then uh, I, I didn't see his Bernard on. No, I guess not. So I, this was, Oh, just a beautiful shot and that he sent in from uh, you know his observatory in near Lewisport. Um, just spectacular iron tail there. Um, nice place, uh, nice and dark there, and uh, two and a half hours. So, uh, and one of the issues that I ran into is that uh, the comet's moving fast enough that over that that kind of time it really sort of moves a long way against the star trail so I don't know how I mean picks insight must just have to pick you know the 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 stars at a certain time because by the end of two and a half hours it would probably be right off the end of that uh, star trail, but 
Cool. And then this is Jim. This was a very cold night, right? Um, I don't know. Sure. I'm still numb. <laughs> yeah, February first. I tried and and I didn't. I didn't cool my telescope down enough, and the focus changed while I was doing the images, and I ended up just throwing them out. But uh, again, you've got a nice. Uh, yeah, again, this is more, more, more time. He's certainly Bernard, when he had two and a half hours worth of time there, I think this one is uh, is about an hour. Uh, yeah, 180 divided by three is is an hour basically. And so, uh, how do you deal with the fact that it, it's really? And I was just tracking with sort of normal star track. Now I'm not guiding. Um, oh, you're not guiding either. Okay, yeah, um, so no, I wasn't guiding. I wasn't guiding, but uh, I was tracking the stars with, to fairly high accuracy. And so the the comet basically is drifting through the field of view as you're taking all these exposures. So you do two processing passes. One, you stack the comet without the stars. And uh, you, you do that with a special uh, algorithm in, in, in Pix Insight to do that. Um, and then there's a, and then the second uh, processing is uh, is it's basically aligning the stars. Um, so and then then, then recombining them and in, in, uh, so that's that's how that particular picture was done. But I, so I get, found I had to actually reframe while I was collecting the data. I had actually had to sort of skip um, the telescope along a little bit. I couldn't just stay. Um, tracking the stars because the comma was sort of comma was getting pretty close to the edge of the frame. It yeah, I know that, that these, I've got these, a narrower field of view. These are all the technical details you have to deal with yeah. in real time. So, did you have to do that? Uh, no, I had a, 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 a wide enough field of view with the with the lens I was using so that um, it it. Uh, oh, right, because you're using your. Yeah, it's 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 not a telescope. It's a, it's actually a lens. So, okay, very good. Thanks. And so then we have a couple of pictures from Chris um, of the sun, and uh, so this one was January twenty eighth, and there's beautiful detail there and some uh, remarkable uh, prominences. And then a few days ago, he said this one, which is even more amazing. So I'll let Chris say a little bit about this. Um, I mean, that's, that's just amazing out of a PST. Uh, thanks. Yeah, it's proof that a telescope with only 40 millimeters of aperture can, can do amazing things. Um, the important thing is to be able to focus. Uh, so, um, and, you, and in full sunlight, uh, that means you need to have your laptop controlling a little camera with small pixels. Uh, in the shadows, um, and just you know, try a few and make sure you get it focused. Uh, the other important thing with doing this sort of image is that you need very, very high dynamic range. So you set the gain in your camera to zero, and then just adjust the exposure time until you get uh, uh, a decent image in real time. And then when you take a video clip and add it up, um, you can improve it. Uh, so the camera used here is one of these little red uh, eyepiece cams. Um, this is a Zwo uh, eyepiece cam. It actually fits in to the one and a quarter inch holder it's used for planetary imaging. And uh, you can sl slip it into the focuser and get it close enough to where the focus is. Some other cameras, you can't reach focus on this. So it's a small telescope. I had it on a tracker. Wasn't the line particularly well. I just whacked it on the ground and the axis pointed north. It was good enough for 30 second clips. And I took, uh, what, three 30 second clips. I only used one of them, only used half the frames. So um, with some precautions, I put the telescope outside and let it cool down for half an hour first to make sure there is no heat in the telescope, a bunch of things like that. The only thing I wanna point out with this image that I thought was rather cool is the upper left-hand corner. Um, you can see a prominence, that's it, both up in front of the disk and off the disk. So it's a three-dimensional thing. And I thought that's very cool. That, that sort of shows you the true nature of, 
of a line of prominences. And though all the white stuff on the middle right is, uh, I think there's an M flare going on uh, while, because that's, that's very bright white in the image. It was pretty cool. The sun's a neat thing. Uh, yeah, again, that, again, again, don't ever look at the sun through an unfiltered telescope, ever. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so this is an ASI 290 mm mini. And I guess the one that I'm using, which is maybe a, an older version, is the 120 mm mini. So you've got much smaller pixels with this one? A little smaller, 2.9 micron pixels. Oh, yeah, the MM instead of MC. A monochrome camera. This is a, a telescope that filters only H alpha through. So it's exactly one wavelength. So it's monochrome anyway. Um, you have twice the resolution with a monochrome camera as you do with a color camera with the same size pixels, because actually those pixels are grouped in fours and they're averaged. Um, so with a monochrome camera, what the pixels are is what you get. It's nice and sharp. Okay, good. Thanks a lot. And I think the next one's your new camera. Oh, yeah. Um, we all talk about, or at least the imagers talk about Zwo and QHY CCD as the two big vendors. Well, there are others. And one of those others is Player One. And I looked at their stuff online and went, really? And that looks like good quality. And then it had a few features which the others didn't have. And I went, oh, yeah, I'm going to try one of those. And, and uh, a company in Ontario had one on for sale. I bought it. And um, I put it on the scope. Very sensitive. Oh, yeah, it has the latest generation Sony chip in it. Very, very sensitive. And I pointed it at the trapezium region in, in the Orion Nebula. And uh, I could actually have done this with quarter second exposures, believe it or not. But it would have had to have taken a whole lot of them. So I shot two second exposures. Wow. This, um, and some 90 of them and 83 of them were added. A couple of them were, were bad. And um, this is not even pushed particularly hard. I didn't want to blow out the trapezium. Um, so I'm very impressed. This, this chip is extremely sensitive. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to look forward to using it again, maybe even after the meeting tonight. Cool. OK, thanks a lot. So I think that's it. So um, uh, I think I'll invite Robert. Um, to uh is robert there yep i'm here okay did you want to share the screen or do you want me to bring it up no you can bring it up okay just give me a second here see if this works so uh can people see the sky this month is that working? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so yeah. you just tell me when to change pages. Yeah, okay. Well, if you follow along, you'll figure that out too. Probably. Yeah. So uh, um, I actually uh, uh, I talked last month about about that word, that uh, <laughs> Nithirium, I think it is. Uh, I asked... Uh, my Google Assistant, how to pronounce it, but uh, I'm not sure if I got it right or not. But <laughs> anyway, it's day night cycle, so maybe I'll change it back to day night, it's easier to say. <laughs> uh, anyway, this uh, simply shows us the uh, the day night cycle how many hours of uh, of uh, uh, length of the day that we uh, have, and you can follow it month to month and see how it changes and when. Uh, also on this, you can see uh, when civil twilight, nautical twilight, and astronomical twilight uh, occur. So that uh, that's important, especially if you're going to uh, do any imaging, I suppose. But it's important to uh, observational as well. So uh, next page, please. And uh, here we see the sun, uh, image of the sun from uh, today. I, uh, I didn't include the sunspot numbers um, in this particular image, and I'm um, not sure why. 
but uh, it shows that there are some sunspots, sunspots occurring uh, right right now on the sun. So there is some uh, detail there to to be seen, as we've seen from uh, Chris's uh, uh, image, of course. And uh, this image, of course, is just uh, white light, right? There's no, it's not an H alpha. So all you see is the uh, the, the spots themselves. Uh, the moon is a waning crescent now, approaching new moon. And of course, we know new moon is the time uh, of the month when observing is at its best. So we're getting uh, close to that now. If the weather cooperates, uh, maybe we'll be able to partake of it. And then we get to our planet roundup. And uh, I've been thinking about changing the format of this, but I won't go into that now. So Mercury um, is uh, in front of the sun at inferior conjunction, so it's not observable. And uh, Venus becomes observable, observable about 545, about 18 degrees above the southwestern horizon. It sits at 743. Uh, next page, uh, Mars, uh, which is exceedingly uh, small now uh, compared to when it was at its, uh, oh, what's the word? It's uh, not its opposition. Uh, uh, what is it? Yeah, opposition. Okay, yeah. It was uh, much closer to us uh, in its uh, position uh, in the solar system. So it was a bigger disk, but uh, right now it's a, a bit smaller. Um, but anyway, this tells us when it becomes observable, and it's about 60 degrees, 63 degrees above the horizon, so that's pretty good. Um, uh, and uh, when does it set? It sets at uh, 2 a.m.? No. Uh, this says 2 a.m. Is that correct? Not sure if that's correct. Could be. Yeah. In any case, uh, uh, it is possible when you're creating this document, it's quite a lengthy document, there's a fair bit of, uh, of research goes into uh, getting it there and sometimes uh, mistakes happen with it, but um, in any case, anybody wants to chase that, they can. Jupiter is on its way uh, to pass behind the sun, uh, solar conjunction, it becomes visible at 542, 31 degrees above the horizon should be viewed as early as possible or quickly as possible once darkness falls because it's low in the sky and only gets lower. And the closer it gets to the horizon, well, things become um, blurred. Saturn is probably uh, close to the same way. Let's see, it's headed for solar conjunction. Yeah, it becomes visible about 530, but oh, it's only 12 degrees above the horizon. So that makes view viewing questionable at at best because of the amount of atmosphere that you have to see through. But I'm sure it would still be a nice sight. You'd be able to see the rings. So uh, by all means, uh, catch a glimpse before it's uh, gone for a month or so. Uh, Uranus currently an early evening receding into twilight, uh, poss possible to resolve into an active colored tiny disc in a medium sized scope. I think that's probably a six inch at about 7 p.m. and it's about 58 degrees above the southeastern horizon. So yeah, that's a, a possibility to grab that. Uh, Neptune uh, is only a possible, a faint possible to glimpse at 6 p.m. because it's only 30 degrees above the horizon. So as I said, good luck with that. And uh, moving on, uh, next, Page. There we go. Uh, this shows us uh, <clears throat> uh, Comet Roundup. And uh, well, we just had some talk about our, our uh, newest uh, comet. Well, it was, what is it, 50,000 year uh, cycle on that comet, I think, on C2022 E3ZTF is a good name. Um, and uh, so it's dimming right now, but it is still possible to see. And uh, you can see there February 1st, February 15th, February 28th, the magnitude and the diameter. 
And uh, I'm sure if you go to the any of these uh, uh, sky chart things, uh, you'd be able to get a finder chart, which would allow you to star hop uh, to catch uh, it or any of these other faint um, comets. The asteroids, uh, currently the only decent possibilities for us would be Ceres. I guess that's Hebe and Juno. And you can see the magnitudes. Uh, they would appear star-like, of course. Uh, uh, supernova, go ahead. Oh, Robert, I was just gonna point out briefly, uh, when you're on the comets, uh, people might notice that uh, 96 Macholtz is extremely bright. That's not a typo. Oh. The reason okay. it's that bright is because it's very close to the sun. Oh, for real, well then, and on uh, the sky. Uh, Okay, just, to avoid okay. Some, just to avoid some confusion. Uh, okay. okay, yeah, yeah. And I never paid close enough attention to uh, to catch that, but indeed, uh, that might be something to uh, take a take a but look at. Boy, it drops off in a hurry. Indeed it do. Space indeed Weather had do. an article on it last week sometime, I think. Yeah, but it's magnitude 10 right now, so that's, eh, you know. Yeah, but you can still catch it. Yeah, it was it was baked by the sun when it was in the same field of view as a solar satellite viewing it. It yeah, was yeah. a sun grazer for a bit. For yeah. a very brief period, people on the ground here could see it visibly just before or after sunrise or sunset. I forget which it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's interesting. Sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, supernova, there is there is something you can see, but magnitude 13.4 is exceedingly dim, um, but could be done in an imaging cell. So uh, in case somebody wanted to do that, it's in NGC 2708, which is a, a, a galaxy somewhere around Andromeda, or is that 2703? Can't quite remember, but you can look up 2708 and or use Stellarium, one of the plan planetarium programs, and find that, and uh, might be something that somebody is interested in doing. And uh, next page, we have uh, the listing of our principal meteor showers. I think next one is in April sometime, I think. Uh, that would be Lyrids. And uh, so you, we can look forward to having a look at that when the time gets on. Uh, telescopic and binocular deep dark sky objects listing there, uh, the top 10 uh, telescopic and top 10 binocular, and they are all objects that are, you know, fairly uh, easily accessible in our sky. So the listing is for February and for uh, March. And uh, we have a challenge deep sky object for February, IC 443 in Gemini, and in March, April, 30 in cancer and again you can uh, you can look these uh, look these up to see what where they are and then uh, go for it next sheet international space station right now we're in a dearth so i think tonight um i don't know what the time was uh, 4 34 so yeah if anybody can't get to sleep well, at 4.30, maybe you go out on your deck and you might be treated to uh, a pass. Observing sessions, uh, I'm not gonna go through that. That's uh, for, uh, for, all, for all members to uh, read, to get an idea of what uh, is coming our way if, if we're gonna be able to have any. Uh, observing sessions, I'm hopeful, uh, but we'll see. Uh, February observing calendar shows us the, the meeting is tonight, of course, and, and the states of the of the moon, and uh, then the next one will be Mar uh, March, right there, same thing. And uh, that's it, except for uh, I think there's a conjunction coming on March the first for Venus and Jupiter, if I'm not mistaken. So that's something to look for, and that will be in the western sky, of course. Um, so, you know, you'll be able to see uh, those uh, uh, two uh, 
uh, objects, uh, I think maybe about a degree apart, if memory serves me correct. I think half so. Half a degree. Half a degree, is that? Oh, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's pretty good. That's nice and tight. So it's something to look forward to having a look for. That's uh, about the uh, width of the moon, is it? Yeah, half about that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, that's it's pretty close together, no doubt. I'm not sure what kind of a telescope you'd have to have. You'd probably have to use a lens, I suppose, a camera lens to get a wide enough field of view to get, to get the two of them in. But to the unaided eye, they'd be they'd look very, very close. And uh, that's it. Any questions? Next week as well, Robert, uh, in that same area, while they're not close together, the uh, very thin crescent moon would be in between them a couple of nights. Okay. Yep. Yep. And uh, when you see the crescent moon and Venus, uh, I think there's a name on that about a fisherman in a boat that that, that would be like the moon and the trawler man. What is it, uh, Gary? The trawler man. Trawler man, is it? Yeah. yeah. And so Venus is his uh, prize on the end of his line. Is that correct? Yeah, the moon is the boat. Yeah. And Venus, uh, Venus is the sometimes it's Jupiter, but it's called the uh, the trawler man. The fish. Uh, so yeah, from. Uh, from fishermen from Bonavista, or, or, or call it that. Oh, is that right? Is that where yeah. that originated? Yeah, as far as I can tell. Well, oh, uh, that's interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Robert. Um, yeah, that's a nicely laid out uh, document. Good work. Thanks. It was a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, It'd get it'll get easier i guess right yes it will yes okay so that just about wraps it up um the next meeting is part two of filters and that's jim johnson talking about filters for astrophotography and that'll be uh march 15th so hopefully there'll be no no reasons we can't be on campus and I just grabbed uh, before the meeting a screenshot of um, March 1st. So there's uh, Jupiter and Venus. And you can see it is pretty low in the West. Um, Jupiter is coming down, I guess, fairly quickly now to meet Venus. And so you have to look before, you know, this is about 7.30. So sort of from sunset to 7.30, and that's probably when it gets pretty hard to see. Um, so that's what I've got. Um, are there any questions or comments? Or um, we can stay online for a few minutes, and uh, if people want to socialize a little bit. And I'll stop sharing and so we can see all the faces. Uh that Venus and Jupiter conjunction coming up, uh, if they're only a half degree apart, it means you should be able to get them in the same low power eyepiece. True, true, because you get the moon. You know, yeah, I would uh, think so. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Not, like, it's like uh, it was Christmas before last. We had uh, one of my favorite things I ever saw was the uh, Saturn and Jupiter in the same eyepiece. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was so. It should be something like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No. They're both very bright and very different brightnesses. So, no. uh, yeah, huh? it happens. It happens every uh, all the time. I mean, year after if when you when you've been looking at the sky for years and years and years, uh, you just get so used to uh, you know understanding the the feel of the planets going around in the solar system because you know when it sets you know, in the West uh, that, uh, you know, approximately how long you got to wait before, oh, it's uh, coming up in the East. And Susan's going, so thanks, Susan. So, um, Gary, uh, yeah. what filter do you use if you want to see Jupiter and Venus at the same time? 
Oh, no, there you go. <laughs> uh, I see, I'd use an, uh, a neutral density filter. That okay. Would, uh, cut the brightness down so that uh, you'd uh, get a nice level between the both. Uh, okay. And the blue to bring out the contrast. So would you use them at the same time? Yep. Pile okay. them up together. Or you can use pile them separate them or pile them up together. So whatever you want. The only thing is that if you take a picture, you'll have a blue cast with it's the blue filter. You know, other than that. Uh, also, guys, uh, uh, Marcus, I put the address in for that filter <laughs> that you can see the cloud, see through the clouds. That, uh, you can go to that site. Yeah, I is that it in up, the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's in the chat. I brought it okay. up, uh, and I'm, I'll am i look at it afterwards. Yeah, I don't know if it's real. <laughs> Must be an X-ray X filter. Uh, well, 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 it would make some sense if it was near infrared, which cameras are sensitive to, but it, does this thing claim to be a visual filter? Uh, if it I was red, maybe. No, I think it's more for photography. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it was I, 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 when I was looking it up, this came up and I said, okay, I couldn't tell if it was a joke or not, type of thing. All right. They finally it's have a revolutionary. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, good night, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Good night. 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 Good night.